Okay. We're off and recording. Um, so that if you want to uh, revisit the webinar later or want to share the link with a friend who wasn't able to be here, um, you are certainly welcome to do that. Please type any questions that occur to you along the way into the chat window. Um, it looks like um, uh, hopefully Karen is on with us and will be tracking those and sharing them with me as we go along. Uh, you can download a copy of the slides. I pasted a link into the chat window. And Karen, perhaps you might copy and paste it again just for those who have joined us more recently. I don't think they see the very beginning of the chat conversation. Uh, if you would like a certificate of participation, um, uh, I think you had an opportunity to uh, sign up for that when you registered. But if not, um, you're welcome to just chat that. Uh, information as well, and we will take care of it. So we're off and running, ready to get started. What I wanted to do was start off thinking about um, what we think the basics of reading are. And what I'd like to do at this point is have you type um, your thoughts into the chat window about in your experience with the students uh, that you work with, uh, learning to read and all that kind of thing. Um, what would you um, say are the basics of reading? I'm going to give everybody a little chance to share their thoughts. Okay, I'm not saying much, but hopefully you're thinking about it. Oh, well, here we go. Being able to comprehend and understand the items read. Okay, makes sense. What are some other basics of reading? Decoding, great. Renee says the six components of reading. Might share with us what some of those other ones are. Oh, writing included, okay. Very good. All right, well, thanks Thanks for sharing those thoughts with us. And in fact, when I talk to most educators and ask them this question, what I hear are pretty much the following, decoding and fluency and comprehension. And these are all, in fact, important skills. We need these skills to read. We have to acquire these skills. They don't just develop automatically. But it doesn't explain how we learn them. And it turns out that there are some even more basic skills than these. And this brings up a sort of dichotomy that we need to um, focus on. I think that it's helpful to focus on when we're looking at what the components of these are. And there's a cognitive neuropsychologist by the name of Jack Naglieri, who's done a lot of work in the area of cognition um, and cognitive assessment, um, culturally unbiased cognitive assessment uh, in particular. And he uh, sets it up sort of this way, which is there's a difference between cognition and knowledge. What does a student have to know to complete a task? That's knowledge. So that's the information they have to know. So in order to decode, you know that a, a C makes the K sound. And in a makes the A ah sound, and the T makes the T sound. And that's all important, but it doesn't really tell us how a student has to think to complete the task. And what he has developed based on uh, years and years of research is a view of basic psychological processes, the how we think, not the what we know, but the how we think, that uh, will determine and play a big role in uh, reading and math and, frankly, everything else that we do. And he refers to these, this is actually called the PATH theory of intelligence. And the PATH stands, P the stands for planning, the A for attention, and the two S's for simultaneous and successive processing. So planning is thinking about how you do whatever you decide you're going to do. Attention, we're probably all pretty familiar with that uh, concept as well. 
being alert, but also resisting distractions. Um, simultaneous is seeing everything together, sort of getting the big picture. And the successive is, of course, following a sequence. I also call it sequential processing sometimes. So if I call it that, hopefully you'll know that I'm referring to the same process. So the planning part is um, a pretty complex cognitive process in itself, although it's even more fundamental than decoding or fluency or comprehension. It's where we figure out what a task is all about and we, our brains uh, decide how we're going to approach that task. I think about this in the context of reading as um, uh, we can read in different ways. You know, we can, uh, we might have to uh, tackle a word that we don't know and come up with a strategy as to how to, to tackle it, how to attack that word. Or we may already know it and it's sight word and it just appears. We may be reading for the overall gist of something. We may be reading for a particular detail. We may be reading uh, line by line, word by word, trying to memorize something. And then as we're engaged in the task, we're sort of keeping track of how we're doing. Uh, if we say a wrong word or we say pronounce a word that we don't uh, recognize, it doesn't we can't associate it with something that we know. Um, exercising impulse control and self-control, um, so not blurting a word out. Uh, controlling our processing and then retrieving knowledge. So we have to, um, if we know what a passage is about that we're about to read, we're going to activate and think about what we already know about that. And we do that, of course, all the way through the reading process. Um, attention refers to here um, both sustained and selective attention. Um, many of you who are familiar with the, some of the cognitive training work we do know that we distinguish between those. Um, but it's really um, both the process of being able to sustain focus for an extended period of time, but also to resist distractions, to screen out so the stimuli that really aren't uh, relevant to what we're doing. And in fact, when we have students with attention difficulties or with ADHD and things like that, um, the biggest problem is typically their ability to screen things out. It's that they're, not that they can't pay attention, but that they're paying attention to everything. And they're, um, I was looking for one of those pictures of the, the dog who sees a butterfly out the window and goes, butterfly or squirrel. And, things like that, I think that would have, <laughs> that to me just captures the essence of that, um, the challenge with attention. Simultaneous um, uh, processing is combining stimuli into groups. Um, I like this little example that uh, Dr. Naglieri uses, which is we see discrete elements, but we visualize them and we understand them as a whole. We relate the pieces to the parts. We actually see a square where there is no square in the center of that pattern. Um, we recognize patterns. We associate with other things that we know, and we get that overall idea of what's going on. Successive processing, on the other hand, is managing not all at once, but in an order, keeping things in a progression. The stimuli here do not have to be interrelated. Uh, they could be, that, and uh, this is an example where they're not, cow, wall, cow, girl. But sometimes it's important if we think about these as letters in a word or something like that, uh, the fact that it, uh, uh, the word starts with a C or with a W or with an A doesn't necessarily tell you what the next um, item in the sequence is going to be. Um, other kind of real world examples is our ability to follow a set of directions. Um, things like, please go up to your room and get your soccer uniform. And on your way down, don't forget to bring your spelling words because we'll practice them in the car and make sure that um, you also grab your, your uh, orange juice and your toast on the way out. And, you know, very often by the time the child gets to the car, 
none of that may be with them or some of it may be with them, but, you know, keeping that in order rather than having to go back up and um, get that spelling list again because you forgot it on the way down. So this is another way of sort of piecing together all of this um, processing that's going on, the how we think versus the what we know when we're engaged in the process of reading. So what we think about it is decoding fluency and comprehension, and those skills are essential. We have to, can't be good readers without them. There's some things, a whole bunch of things that are going on underneath to allow that to happen. In fact, there is no decoding part of our brain. In order to decode, we actually build a connection between parts of our brain that uh, were designed for different aspects of language and vision, and we have to sort of co-ops them um, and get them to work together and build a connection that isn't there naturally. At the same time, all of these other processes that you see here are going on. We have to sustain our attention. Our attention can wander off in microseconds, in milliseconds, and um, you know, in much less time than it takes us to decode a word. Um, so you may have sometimes seen a student start to sound out a word, lose track of where they are, and have to start it all over again. Visual discrimination, uh, very rapidly, in again, fractions of a second, seeing the difference between a B and a P or an M and an N. Sequential processing, like successive processing, keeping the letters or the words in the right order as they're coming into our brains. And then auditory discrimination. Uh, we have to be able to hear the difference between phonemes um, in order to distinguish the meaning of words. And we have to both see those in written form and hear them uh, when it's part of the reading process. When it comes to fluency, um, a lot of the time what we do is we just, uh, once students start to decode, we just have them do it over and over and over again and hopefully build up fluency. But there's some processes here, some underlying how we think pieces that are critical. Um, one example is visual span, which is how much information we can take it in a glance. Our flexible attention. So, for example, uh, we've talked in some of our other webinars about the, the um, different processes our brains use to sound out words versus recognizing sight words. So those are two different uh, pathways in the brain that we engage when we do those two different processes and our ability to switch back and forth between them fluently and easily is flexible attention or cognitive flexibility. And then of course, processing speed is gonna have an impact on fluency, uh, the speed with which we actually um, can process and get those, that visual input into um, an auditory and a verbal output. And then ultimately comprehension, of course, is what this webinar is about, and it's what most teachers are the most concerned about. We get most children in school to the point where they can sound out words, and we get them to be reasonably fluent, and then we sort of hope. Um, we say our prayers, and we hope that that makes its way to comprehension. But in many cases, of course, it doesn't. And uh, I can just about any teacher in elementary school at any rate will tell you that they have many students, probably in middle school too, um, many students who can read something um, and sound like they um, are managing it very well, reading even with, um, with feeling, with intonation, and get to the end and not be able to tell you what it's all about. And here's where some of these key um, skills become really, really important. So I have planning here, of course. We talked about that role and how it plays a role in our reading and what we're, how we're reading and monitoring ourselves as we go along. But our visual skills, um, the ability to create a mental picture of what we're reading about. Um, and it might be a physical description of something or it might just be the relationship between different objects. Um, I have a mental visualization of a calendar in my head. Uh, and I see the year goes around in a big circle and I have a sense of where I am in it. So that kind of visualization can be really helpful uh, when we're trying to comprehend something. 
And then working memory is highly correlated with um, reading comprehension. In fact, a lot of our other, just about any academic pursuit you can think of. And working memory, of course, is our ability to hold information in our minds while we manipulate it. So if you think about what happens when you're reading, you're taking in pieces of information, you're holding them in your mind, you're comparing them to what you already know so that you can give them meaning. That's how we create meaning is connecting into an existing network of, of knowledge and information. And so this mental process of working memory is going to be critical. So here's a little example of it from one of my favorite childhood books. Um, hopefully most of you have enjoyed the pleasures of Mary Poppins. I have not seen the new movie, but I do want to go see it. So this is how it begins. If you want to find Cherry Tree Lane, all you have to do is ask the policeman at the crossroads. He will push his helmet slightly to one side, scratch his head thoughtfully, and then he will point his huge white glove finger and say, first to your right, second to your left, sharp right again, and you're there. Good morning. So if this were real life, we would really have to hang on to those directions. And what happens after you take that sharp right? What happens after you take that second left? Which direction are you going to go? Your ability to see that, to visualize it, to hold it in working memory are really key to your ability to understand that. And that's a lot of the reason that, that Skate Kids and Ramps to Reading, which is a second version of the program, were developed. It was all based on this, uh, the Jack Naglieri's theory of the past theory of intelligence. And so what it does is integrates those cognitive skills necessary for reading with literacy skills as recommended by the National Reading Panel. It's designed to enhance the curriculum, so it's not a replacement for a reading program, but it can work in just about any instructional setting as a supplement to direct instruction. Um, one of the things that is um, so wonderful about it is it's delivered in a uh, very engaging video game kind of format, as you'll see. Um, in terms of recommended usage, typically the, the, the um, significant results and the benefit are seen in just an hour a week. Um, it can be um, all at one session for some older kids, younger kids, probably you're going to want to look at um, 15 or 20 minute sessions, but it doesn't have to be a big block. So you can squeeze it in a lot of different ways in a lot of different um, uh, situations and environments. It's really easy to implement. Pretty much you um, sign it, put the kids in and, and uh, get them on the program and off they go. And there are two versions. One is the Skate Kids is the version for ages 7 to 12. It does assume a little bit of um, independent reading, um, ramps to reading, which is for the um, younger ages, does not. And so, of course, while we put ages here, these are general recommendations. It doesn't mean um, that uh, a younger student who is already reading can't be in Skate Kids, and, and uh, the reverse would be the case for students who are older but um, struggling. The nice thing about the program is that if you have a license, you have a license and can move a child back and forth between either one of them. So you don't have to know which one you want. You can, they can graduate or they can go back and get a little bit of extra support if they need it. So this is a chart that shows the skills that are developed um, in the program. You can see the, at the very top those basic thinking skills, attention and planning, and the two S's, simultaneous and sequential processing. And then you can see some advanced thinking strategies. Uh, the chart also contains the reading, the reading skills from the National Reading Panel, but I just am showing this part of it. Uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into, uh, as I do the demonstration, uh, and pick not all of them. You can see there are 12 different exercises or uh, games within Skate Kids. And we're going to look at four of them. Um, one, we'll see a little bit about how the planning comes into uh, uh, play, uh, how simultaneous processing um, and also planning comes into um, a comprehension exercise called Gallup Park. And then we'll look at a couple of others that focus one on attention and one on successive 
processing. So I thought that might be a nice way to go through it. And we'll do the same for ramps to reading. Um, okay, so we're ready for the demonstration. What I'm going to do now is um, switch my sound around just a little bit here. Be able to hear the sound on my computer. And there's definitely music and all kinds of video game sound and stuff in the program, so I want you to be able to um, to hear that. But I may mute my computer. Um, as we're going through this. Okay, so it's going to make me log in again. Just okay. So this is the where you um, would go to log in to either of the programs. Um, you can see on the left, I'll just show you this really briefly. So this is that interactive chart that I showed you some of with the thinking skills and advanced thinking skills and the national reading panel skills. And the same is provided for ramps to reading. Um, and then we go over to the side and we're gonna play. And I'll start with Skate Kids. So I'm gonna log in. Starts with a little movie. Uh, which the kids can watch or not. I'm just going to skip it for now. Um, and I don't have the sound on my computer on, so um, <clears throat> that's why you're not hearing it. And uh, so this is what it looks like. These are all the games uh, within the program. I can also see them like a, uh, a theme park or something like that where we have the snow area and the town area and the beach area and the amusement park area. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on. But as I said, I wanted to share with you a few of the exercises in the program. And I'm going to start with one called Board Tech. Now, Board Tech works on um, planning, also simultaneous processing. Helps us learn how to hold information in working memory and to chunk that information to help us remember it as well. So what happens here is that, um, I'm just going to go ahead, this is level one. And we're going to see on our skateboard, we're going to see a design. It's going to have some shapes. And then we're going to, they're going to disappear after we look at them for a little while. And our job is going to be to recreate them and to create that same design that we saw. So let's go ahead and get that going. And I'm going to leave my sound off for now. So here I see the design. It's three circles, and they are yellow and purple and blue. And I'm saying that out loud for a reason, because hopefully I'll remember it. So I grab that little circle, and I put them up. And there are hot spots, so if I get anywhere close, it's going to pop it into to the spot there. I don't have to remember it exactly. And then, of course, the, the circles all start off yellow, and I need to change their colors to match the design that I first saw. So I'm going to go up here and use my paintbrush. I'm going to grab the purple, I think was the first one, the second one. And then I'm going to grab the blue and change that color. Now I'm going to turn my sound on just for fun here. Let's see, how do we do? Oh, I did it. Good. So now we're going to get another design. And this time, I'm not going to actually try to remember it because um, what I, all I really want to do at this point is give you an example of um, how it's going to get more complex and how many more adjustments we may have to make to these shapes as we go up in level. So I just put three shapes on here. I know, I know they were all this little flag kind of shape, so um, I'm not trying to actually get it right. So in addition to changing the colors of the objects, I have three other tools that I can use. One is a rotation tool. So that'll turn it around, quarter turn, um, each time I click on it. Um, I also have a tool that will make something bigger. So maybe I have to make it bigger, and I also have to change the color. And then I have another tool that will reverse something, which, of course, is different from rotating it. So I really have to be able to get my um, visual spatial 
process is working well to figure out whether something is going to be a rotation or flipping it and having the mirror image. So as you can see, there could be quite a lot that goes on when we get up into those upper levels. So chunking that information to be able to keep track of it. Um, and then, of course, creating that, um, planning how we're going to do that, and also um, being able to see the, the whole picture and make sure that it's uh, working together. So that is board tech. Now, as I leave, you're going to see me accumulating a whole bunch of points towards a trophy and credits and uh, these treasure boxes and things like that. And there's, that's part of the reward system. And I'll share a little bit more with you about that before we leave the demonstration. So I'm going to stop there. And the second one I wanted to share with you was an exercise called um, No Board Blast. Of course, everything has a snowboard or skateboard or some kind of board um, theme to it. And um, this is one that combines sequential processing, um, focusing on that, with sonics. Um, so this is a nice example of how we can combine those uh, different skills into the process that we use to actually decode, uh, which is a really important part. We have to address each letter or group of letters as we find them. We have to figure out what sound they make, and then we have to keep that all in mind as we pull it together to create a word at the end. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing here in Snowboard Blast. Now I am going to go ahead and, um, oops, let me go back just a second. And I want to make sure I'm at the, okay, we'll go ahead and start. So what's going to be happening is my avatar is going to be sliding down the slope on the snowboard. And I'm going to see letters that are red and letters that are black. And I'm going to pick up the red letters. I'm going to use my the arrow keys to go back and forth, moving my avatar around, just like at a uh, racing game or something like that. And I, there are going to be obstacles that I have to avoid, so I have to screen out those distractions. I got to focus my attention, and I'm going to have to. When I pick up the red letters, I'm going to hear the phoneme that is associated associated with that letter or letters, and I'm going to have to keep those in my mind. That sequence of letters and phonemes and sounds that I'm hearing, and then they're going to spell a word. So. Um, I am going to turn my sound back on. You're going to hear music along with the um, phoneme. And so it's going to be a little hard for me to talk while I'm doing it, but hopefully we'll all be able to follow along and hear and see and pick up these letters. So here we go. Select the red letters only. Remember the order and sounds of the letters, and then combine them with the words. Okay, well, i got to avoid those rocks first. All right, come on. All right, there we go. Now I'm looking for those red letters. So I got an A. Am I moving back and forth? Oh, no, I hit the tree. Listen for the sound you need, and then click that button. OK. So I heard the sound A, which was an AI, and I heard the sound er. Turn my sound off again. So now I have this array of letters that and that make different sounds. And so when I move my cursor, I I'm going to see all the ways that there are to spell that particular sound. So the A sound is very very common in English and can be spelled a lot of different ways. So here are all of the ways that we can spell A in English. And of course, what I saw was the AI. So I'm going to grab the AI and I'm going to move it up to the top. And then I want the er sound. So I'm going to go and hover over here again and I'm going to see all the ways that we can spell the er sound in English. And this is level one, so it's going to probably be the basic one. I'm going to go ahead and move that R up. And I got it right. And then I get to do it again. 
what's going to happen is that as I make progress and go up levels, I'm going to basically have experience with all of those sounds. Um, and by the time I'm done, I will have been challenged to find the the PT, pronounced to and pterodactyl, the uh, silent MB sound, the silent B sound, and I so all all of the combinations IGH and things like that. So I'm going to hit all of those um, difficult combinations and spellings and things like that. Now the next one I want to show you is Gallup Park. This is one of my very favorites because this is what really I believe distinguishes the program aside from the incorporation of all of these critical cognitive skills. So the first two, the first one we did that um, uh, board tech is really mostly a cognitive exercise. The next one we did, Snowboard Blast, combined some cognitive processing, but also a strong focus on phonics. Gallup Park is one of the exercises that focuses intensively on comprehension, and in a way that's quite different from other reading programs. So most reading programs that I've seen, <clears throat> when they're trying to look at comprehension, you'll read a text, and then you will answer some questions about it, or you'll fill in the blank with words that might clarify the meaning of the text or show that you understand it. And that's good because the, the, that's fine. The, the, there are good ways to show that you understand it, sometimes better than others. But it's not the process we actually use to understand. When we actually understand something, we're, we're visualizing it, we're holding information and working memory. And that's exactly what Gallup Park does. So this is Gallup Park. Uh, you can see the skate kids, Riddle Brad, Tan, and Kaz. Um, you can see the various items they may be using. You can see that they have different colored skateboards and it can be different times of the day. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to read a little text and then we have to recreate what we read about um, in the image, in the, the, uh, the visual um, image of Gallup Park. So it starts off, this is level one. So this is the kind of, the level of independent reading um, that is involved at the, at the beginning of Skate Kids. And of course, ramps to reading is for those who are not ready for that yet. I'll show you that in a couple minutes. So Kaz is on the bench below the red tree. Brad is on the fountain next to her. Let's see if we can remember that. Kaz is on the red bench and Brad is on the fountain, I think. Well, let's see how I did with that one. Okay, we need a plan. All right, I didn't get it. How do we remember all those details? Kaz is on the bench below the red tree. I'm not the red bench. Brad is on the fountain next to her. Okay, so Kaz is on the bench and Brad is on the fountain next to her. So put him here. Let's see. Sweet. All right, I got it that time. Brad eats ice cream on the red bench. All right, so we're going to put Brad on that red bench, and we're going to give him his ice cream cone. Looks like he's enjoying it, doesn't he? Now, if instead of that, if we wanted to give him his chewing gum, let's see if I can do that. Look what he does with his chewing gum. He actually blows a bubble with it. At any rate, okay, so I think you get the idea here. What we're really doing is we're really using the, the skills that we are involved and we're training the skills that are involved in holding on to information, visualizing to do that. And as we get up in levels here, the texts are gonna become longer. At the top level, the sixth level, we're reading um, at a sixth grade reading level. So it can be used um, up to that point. All right, so I'm gonna again, I'm gonna leave this. I'm going to do one more exercise here because it focuses on um, attention. 
Also, it puts a lot of demand on working memory, I will tell you that. And this is, happens to be my very favorite exercise in the program. It's called Soda Jerk. And this is how this works. So there's an ice cream machine. There's a place that creates the base for the ice cream. And a customer comes in, and I have to click to walk over. You can see he's now reading his menu. And then this little bubble is what he's ordering. He wants this brown chocolate cookie base or whatever it is. Oops, I've got another customer. I better go over and do that. So I'm going to go get the ice cream for the first one. I'm going to come back and start the base for the second one. I'm going to go back and pick up the order for the first one and take it to the customer who's getting impatient. Ay, ay, ay. It's going too fast for me today. Take that over there, and then I'll take it with this customer. So anyway, you can get the idea. I could um, sort of lose track of what I'm doing and um, completely just keep playing this for a while because it's one of my favorites. But keeping track of where you are in the sequence, uh, being focused on one thing at a time and shifting your focus, screening out all those irrelevant details. So a lot going on that really strengthen those underlying cognitive skills. For those of you who are familiar with Brainware Safari, which is our cognitive training tool, um, the set of skills that are developed in Skate Kids are narrower. It's uh, not quite as broad as Brainware, um, but does a really good job on some of these key skills that are uh, directly related to reading. One other quick thing I just want to show you before we leave, as I, I said, I would uh, show you part of the reward system here. This is my little avatar. And we can go to the virtual mall and we can buy cool stuff. So for example, I can come in here and decide what kind of hair I want. I can have purple hair or blue hair or green hair, um, choose my shirt and all those sorts of things. As you could see, my avatar was fairly conservative um, in their dress, which would be um, much like me. Um, and then I can buy other things that will um, that I use to decorate my house, and uh, I can visit my house and I can see the decorations and place them where I want them and um, and all that kind of thing. So it's a wonderful, really well done reward system that the kids love. And of course, they need to earn the credit to buy these things, so that's the incentive to keep working and to try when it's hard in some of those exercises, which will get very challenging. All right, so I'm gonna leave there. And now what I wanna do is I wanna just go briefly into grants to reading, so that you just get a little bit of a sense for, um, diamond circle, I have to remember my password for that one. So this is um, similar kinds of exercises, but at a um, much more simple level. So I'm going to start with Design a Door, which is sort of the ramps equivalent to board tech. And um, everything in the here is uh, voiced over, so there's no independent reading required. Play. Okay, so I play, and then it will tell me again. Play. You will be shown a design on the door, and then you can recreate it using the shapes provided. Okay, so we're going to see the design on the door, and then we're going to recreate it, just like we did in Vortex. But as you can see, this starts off much simpler. All we need to remember is that it was three purple rectangles. And when the time's up, <laughs> we're going to grab those rectangles and put them on the door. We don't need to worry about changing colors at this level. We just want to get that right. Amazing. All right, so we did really well. And then we got another design. And here it's uh, two different kinds of shapes, but still no need to change the shapes or anything like that. As we move up in levels, we will get to use some of those other tools. You can see these grayed out crayons here. So when we get to a higher level, we will be able to um, 
uh, we might have to change a color, we might have to make something bigger, we might have to rotate it. Um, but still, working on those same skills in a very similar way, but at a more basic level. I'd like to share another exercise with you that is um, a phonics-based exercise and the sequential processing, a successive processing exercise. And again, this is going to be very basic, and I'm going to turn my sound back on now. Select the letter that is shown to win. All I have to do is to move my mouse back and forth, right to left, left to right, um, to control my little rocket racer. I'm moving him right, now I'm moving him back. Okay, so I need to collect the P, the P sound, twice in a row, so I have to avoid the other one. Oh, there's a P, and I move over to get that. Oh, uh, can I get that one? Okay, I did it. How did you remember that sound? Good job. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to pick up the disc sound. And then as we go up in levels, we're going to have two different sounds. We can move up to three sounds. Okay. That's right. Nice work on that sound. You have stopped the game. If you okay. leave this game well, now, you won't win a prize for finishing the level. Well, I guess I'm just not going to win my prize yet. So just as in um, we win prizes, just as we did in, in um, uh, the Skate Kids version, it's a little simpler, um, so we don't uh, choose or go shopping, but we do get a prize at every level that we use uh, to go decorate our house. And so you can see I can go walk around my house, and I can see this lovely artwork on the wall, and I can go through the door and see this terrific light fixture and that rug and um and i know you're all very jealous okay so that oh one more game we want to do so i wanted to share with you the um comprehension focused exercise here it's called silly scenes and very similar to gala park except that everything is going to be read aloud to us Oops, I turned that off. I didn't mean to. Once the scene is done, press the finish button. If you make a mistake, press the clear button to start over. Okay, so we're going to um, hear the story. And start. It is hard to see in the dark. That is okay. The boy still pulls the cart. The girl likes riding in the dark. The stars help them see the path. Okay, so we know it's dark out, and the boy is pulling the cart, and the girl is riding the cart. So we need to change a couple of things about this scene. We're going to make it nighttime, so I'm going to click on the moon, and you can see we get the moon and the stars. And then I'm going to get my little girl, and she's going to pop her right into the, um, the cart, the wagon. And uh, now I think I'm done. Let's see. Good work. Camping is fun at dark. The dog sits on the mat. The cat sits next to the dog. They must sleep soon. Okay, so I need to put the mat in the picture. So the cat is there on the mat, and now I need to put the dog on the mat. So I put him over here. Let's say I put him on the log instead. Okay, we need a plan. Figure out how to remember all those details. Camping is fun at dark. The dog sits on the mat. The cat sits next to the dog. They must sleep soon. Okay, so put the mat. Oh, the dog has to be on the mat, of course. And now we've got it right. Wowzers. The sun is hot. Okay. If you have stopped the game. If you leave this game now, you won't win a prize. I guess I'm not going to win my prize today again. All right. So hopefully that gives you a good um, feeling for the uh, two programs or the two versions of the program and how they work. Um, 
both of them allow you to monitor um, uh, students' progress in the, pro in the, in the program, um, how many levels they've completed in each of the exercises. It will group the activities in terms of the three areas that I mentioned, the cognitive um, uh, exercises, the phonics and phonemic awareness exercises, and the comprehension. Um, just to give you a little bit of sense of the kind of impact the program has had, um, used often with students in um, uh, economically disadvantaged schools uh, who were uh, often a few grade levels, a couple, three grade levels behind in their progress in reading. <clears throat> and this is an example in the Socorro School District in Arizona, where you can see that the school that used where these were actually um, passing on the state uh, assessments um, or the star reading assessment, sorry. The, um, so the school that used it did significantly better than the school that didn't, uh, which and even the school that didn't did, apparently did better than the district as a whole and far, far better than the state average. So the improvement between one uh, year and, and the next was uh, quite, it was 18 percentage points. So rather dramatic. Um, that was at the satisfactory level. Um, also some pretty dramatic results at the advanced level for these fourth graders where um, dramatically uh, more students were passing at that advanced level where uh, typically not much change or some decline even year to year uh, was experienced both at the state and at the district level. Uh, probably won't surprise you to hear that the kids love this program. They are very engaged and they just are really eager and happy doing it. Um, really experience it like a, a video game. Uh, so some of the comments are just so, uh, you can just hear the kids saying them. It's awesome and fun and everybody likes it. And all of us want to play it so bad because we like it. Um, Perhaps a little more surprising is, uh, and this is uh, something that does um, occur from time to time, this is an email that came in actually very recently from um, uh, an older child, uh, or maybe an adult at this point, oh, sophomore in college, so almost adult, um, who wanted to, uh, to get access to her account again and um, remembers her fourth grade experience where um, loving the fact, remembering the houses that you could decorate, um, wanted to, to, you know, get back into it and see the games and see how it goes from an older perspective and um, determined to experience it again because it has such a tremendous impact. So I think when we know that we can see that we can engage kids this way in ways that they really feel that they're benefiting, um, understanding, gaining competence, gaining mastery, and really developing their ability to um, comprehend what we are asking them to read. Um, it can be pretty uh, persuasive. So I'm gonna stop at this point and um, open things up for questions. So Karen, perhaps you can uh, help me out and let me know what kinds of questions are popping up. We had a question earlier about um whether or not you could explain visual span again. Then you play visual span again. All right. So visual span is how much information you can take in at a glance. And if you think about when you're reading, if you can visualize a, a page in a book in front of you. When you're focused on reading a word, you're reading that with your center vision. So you're, you have, um, so basically center vision and then peripheral vision. You're probably familiar with the concept of peripheral vision. People talk about that, especially when you're driving a car or something like that. And so visual span is when you can effectively use both your center vision and your peripheral vision together to take in more information. So when you, when you can take in a whole line or a, a big group of words or something like that when you're reading, when you can get the big perspective, uh, take in more information, you get the whole view of the soccer field. Uh, when you're in your car and you can see both the, the 
uh, what's in front of you as well as cars that may be encroaching on your lane from either side. Those would be examples of using visual span. Okay, and um, Betty Gates was commenting that, that they have several students who love playing the games, and um, it's great that they're learning as they play and their skills are improving. Well, that's, that's terrific. I know that uh, Patty and Dr. Paul have a, a number of students on the program, and uh, it's terrific that they're seeing that progress. And the kids are so engaged and love it. It's just um, when we when you when you get that intensity of effort, when you get that focus because they're really trying to to do it, that's when um, you really see those dramatic gains. Any other questions or anybody have any thoughts? That's all that's in the chat room for now. All right. Well, I know that sometimes people have um, uh, questions that come up afterwards, and so I wanted to share my contact information again with you and um, encourage you to let us know if there's anything that we can help with. If you have questions, if you'd like a certificate of participation, when you watch the recording, uh, uh, whatever kind of follow-up if you'd like to um, learn more or get a trial account or anything like that for Skate Kids or Ramps to Reading, um, feel free to be in touch with us. And I look forward to connecting with you and continuing the conversation. So I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your sharing your time with us. And I hope everybody has an absolutely wonderful rest of the afternoon. We'll see you sometime soon, I hope. Bye-bye.